On the 24th of July 2019, Boris Johnson entered Downing Street. But waiting inside was a lesser known figure who'd long harbored a radical vision for the future of the country. When it comes to understanding how the state is failing, he is absolutely the best guy in the business. Dominic Cummings had led the campaign to take Britain out of the European Union. It was about taking back control of the system itself. And it was to him the Prime Minister turned to help shape a vision for a post-Brexit future. Are you now in charge? Are you running number 11 as well as number 10? How do you describe them in a word? Determined. Challenging. Unreasonable. Interesting, unpleasant, funny, dangerous. A renaissance man. A myth maker. Genius. I think he's dull. So he was a professional political shaker-upper. But Cummings' controversial career hadn't sprung from nowhere. It's the story of over two decades of British politics. That phone was probably Conservative Central Office telling you, get down there quick, face some kind of disciplinary action. Yeah, I think they gave it on that a while ago, I think. He's always had a plan. He's always known where he's wanted to go. What happened in this general election shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's been paying attention to his career. But what can Cummings' extraordinary rise tell us about how politics is changing on a national stage? Yeah, he could just completely blow himself up. But if he doesn't, he's going to be a very significant figure for the course of the next 10 years. Neither Dominic Cummings nor Vote Leave sprung into existence spontaneously in 2016. I think the beginning of the story really has to start with, with New Labour. At the end of the 1990s, there was a view of Europe emerging that was not only bringing peace to the European continent, but also power in the, in, in the global economy. Once in each generation, the case for Britain in Europe needs to be remade from first principles. And the time for this generation is now. In the late 90s, the thought was that the mother and father of all battles was going to be over whether Britain was going to join the single currency. So everybody was geared up for that being the battle. The Eurosceptic movement had been fabulously boring. Most people saw it as an eccentric harmlessness. England, wake up! Britain, wake up! Into this came this rather live wire figure of Dominic Cummings. He, he's making his name by the late 90s as someone to watch. I went into politics in the first place because I regard the Euro as a fundamental threat to the British economy and to its democracy. Cummings joined the Eurosceptic fight as director of research at a pressure group opposing the Euro. Gordon Brown's chief economic advisor is now republishing a pamphlet he wrote a few years ago saying what a terrible idea the Euro is. I mean, that's, if that isn't a clear message to the media and to everybody else, I don't know what is. The idea that we're split on this issue is a nonsense, but another issue I would say is the fact that there aren't people within your organisation and within the Conservative Party who are arguing for Britain to completely pull out of Europe altogether. For them to start talking about getting out of the EU and that's our position, well, it's complete deceit. And I remember vividly a, a lunch when I was at the Times with uh, Tony Blair. And he said to me, you know, all this anti-Euro feeling, all this um, opposition to the single currency, it's really just to cover for people who want to leave the European Union. And I said, no, 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 it's not. They're separate projects. Um, how stupid can you get? All of the constitutional arguments were about control and are we able to shape our own destiny the no campaign portrayed the euro as handcuffing britain and emasculating its governing class cummings and his colleagues were determined to give euro skepticism a radical new image dominic came bounding into the room with a sort of tiggerish enthusiasm and he produced a riff on a poster by the sex pistols he was offering a very different, very un-Tory approach to Euroscepticism. Cummings had realised that the Euroskeptic message would hit home harder 
if they talked not about the pros and cons of monetary union, but about the NHS. In a foretaste of what would come later, the campaign produced postcards comparing the annual NHS budget to the cost of joining the euro. But the figures were strongly contested. Critics argued that the true NHS budget was closer to 47 billion and the cost of joining the euro was closer to 12 billion. The numbers are there to trigger a discussion. So is this comparable then? Or is it, you know, OK, well, that was a one-off fee against an annual fee. Uh, they don't care that that, if you like, unravels in that way. They are trying to trigger a debate. This was a method of communication, of propaganda, uh, which was completely careless of uh, the truth, but which served a political, ideological uh, purpose. Dominic Cummings became a, a, a past master at it. Coming soon gained a reputation as a confrontational campaigner. In his battle against the euro, Cummings came head to head with Colin Perry of the Confederation of British Industry. It was late at night and I asked him what his background was, what his experience was. He said he'd been um, doing some wheeling and dealing in Russia as far as I remember. It got a little bit heated. Most businesses want to stay in the EU and they want to keep the pounds. It's a total falsification to say that business is against the euro. It certainly well, is not. All the is now, well, let me just finish a minute. All the surveys taken have shown that there's a majority in favour of joining the euro. That's the only question is when when the time is right. Well, that's there's a hard point. We have somebody just denying that black is white. Yeah. I mean, you're a man who has never worked in, in business that's in your life. I'm not, and I'm you're not. just a, a, a young politician on the make. Time, gentlemen, please. I think we all should go and have a drink now. What happened when you came off air. We had to come down a rather narrow flight of steps from the studio and I led the way down and suddenly felt that he grabbed my shoulders from behind and was trying to push me down the steps. You think he was trying to push you down the stairs? Oh, he, uh, definitely, yes. Yeah. I managed to keep my footing and make my way to the bottom of the steps uh, and then he, I, I turned around to, in, in a sense, confront him and say, stop this, this is nonsense. Um, and he seized me by the, by the tie and, and pushed me against the wall and raised his fist. Were you scared? My main uh, feeling was one of self-preservation, to get out of his clutches. If, if, if somebody in my business had assaulted somebody from a, a rival organisation, he'd have been summarily dismissed. Cummings stated that he and Colin Perry had stumbled into each other. And in spite of an official complaint against him, he kept his job. Cummings glamorised his long-term battle against the CBI in an article for The Telegraph, evoking the gun-toting American writer Hunter S. Thompson. As Hunter S. Thompson wrote of tight ends in presidential elections, real happiness in politics is a wide-open hammer shot on some poor bastard who knows he's trapped but can't flee. That's how we felt for three great years as we knocked the CBI out of the Euro battle. The Eurosceptics were so successful at taking membership of the single currency entirely off the agenda uh, that then the battle became about, do you want Britain to be a member of the European Union at all? Dominic Cummings has a 100% clear objective. No half measures, no going so far and then stopping. It's all the way. That is the, both the, the magic and the richness of the man as well as his sort of horror. Cummings had seen the power in using provocative statistics and had discovered new ways to reframe his message for the public. It was the first step in changing the face of Eurosceptic campaigning. It's a huge Labour victory. The Tories exactly where they were before. Ian Duncan Smith is the new leader of the Conservative Party. In a ballot of more than 300,000 Tory members, he received 61% of the total. So I don't think there was huge excitement when Ian Duncan Smith became leader. It just did not feel as if he was going to be the person who was going to lead the party to, to victory. The Conservatives were looking for someone to head up uh, strategy and communications, and Dominic just, just arrived. Dominic Cummings suddenly joins Ian Duncan Smith as his head of strategy. Where on earth did that come from? Why well, was a natural person to hire somebody, the man behind the No Euro campaign, bring him in, and he'll be able to transform the prospects and the future of the Conservative Party.
They hadn't really had much of a strategy, and it was clear what terrible problems they had, both in terms of the message, the messenger, and the machine. It was a great advice from Michael Corleone in The Godfather. Never hate your enemies. It affects your judgment. A lot of Tories really hate Blair, and it's prevented them from examining how to try and present the Conservative Party as a serious alternative. Cummings, who claims never to have belonged to a political party, now sat at the heart of the Tory establishment. Dominic Cummings walked in, shirt hanging out, scarf, wild hair, and summed up the scale of the problem. His diagnosis was you were going to have to have some shock treatment in order to shift people's perceptions. Cummings arranged for Duncan Smith to travel up to Easter House in Glasgow, a traditional Labour heartland. The idea of a traditional Conservative sort of pitching up to one of the worst housing estates in Britain was completely un, you know, unexpected. That's where he brought that unconventional thinking that of course it's going to be harder to persuade people who voted Labour all their lives to come over, but actually, why not? But Cummings did little to inspire confidence in the party's leader. You'd be invited from time to time to go in and have an off-the-record lunch, and often it would be Ian Duncan Smith sitting at one end of the table looking like a a kind of recently sacked undertaker. And Cummings would berate him and the Tory party for as long as he could get away with. It was like the young princeling was, was humiliating his uncle in front of, you know, mildly embarrassed guests. A contingent of Tory MPs wanted the party to take the lead on the continuing campaign against the Euro. But Cummings believed the Conservatives would do the cause more harm than good and gave an explosive interview to The Independent. For many people, just about the only thing less popular than the Euro is the Tory party. How did that message go down? Um, it didn't go down very well, but then realism very rarely goes down well within the party. Dominic Cummings was yeah. outspoken this week. Uh, did you, did you talk to him about it and encourage him to keep on doing that or well, encourage him to stop? All my advisers uh, I talk to regularly and uh, clearly uh, what I think was being said uh, and is being said and is obviously being debated is uh, what our position is. It's vintage Cummings. Uh, I mean, it was sort of punk rock uh, activism uh, in a party that was desperately seeking stability and um, consistency of message. I remember meeting him at that time, and Dominic being Dominic, he sort of looked rather grumpy and said, I'd do it all again, exactly the same way. Cummings' time as director of strategy came to a close after just eight months. It was, in a way, pure Dom. He, he ended up falling out with people, but then, to his credit, he politely left the building. And, well, maybe, maybe not politely being Dom. Well, what, we're asking what's gone wrong for Ian Duncan Smith. One of the things was possibly what you've been saying about him. You said he was incompetent. Yeah, well, I gave him a year to try and prove himself, to see whether or not uh, I was wrong. It seems to me as, there's some kind of nightmare of the living dead scenario in which he clings on over the next 18 months of the election. Almost nothing could be grimmer than that prospect. Somehow the Tory party has got to get a grip on basic competence. This farce has gone on far too long. OK, Dominic Cumming, thank you very much indeed. That phone was probably, what, Conservative Central Office telling you, get down there quick and face some kind of disciplinary action. <laughs> well no, done. I think they gave up on that a while ago, I think. OK, <laughs> many thanks. Cheers. It all seemed a bit, a bit haywire, fascinating, um, sparks flying, bits of plaster coming off the ceiling. It made great copy. But I think that when he, he left um, Duncan Smith's employ, you wondered whether you'd hear of him again in, 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 in mainstream political life. Cummings had seen earlier than most that the party needed to revamp its image to reach new voters in the regions of the UK. But his explosive approach meant he now found himself on the outside again. For the problems are not all solved, and the battles are not all won. And we stand today on the edge of a new frontier. 
the New Frontiers Foundation was Dom's attempt to create a think tank that would run its own campaigns. It showed a different way forward for the centre-right in the UK. And it combined a Euroscepticism with spending public money wisely. The new frontier is here, whether we seek it or not. I'm asking each of you to be pioneers towards that new frontier. They tried to dress it up with JFK uh, references, but it was incredibly ideological. It was incredibly frank about its uh, right-wing views. Founded in 2003, the New Frontiers Foundation reimagined Britain's place in the world, questioning our membership of the single market and suggesting a possible free trade deal with the US. You see a lot of Dominic Cummings's actual core belief in really quite radical deregulation. It tells you a lot about his real instincts as far as health and education are concerned. The foundation stated, politicians should not be trusted with things as crucial to the nation's future as education and health. I suspect that that early work will prove prophetic. I think Dom is ideologically very, very right wing. And the fact that he doesn't usually talk about that is uh, him being strategic and thoughtful about how to win the electorate in any given moment. With the New Frontiers Foundation, it was almost sort of like he uh, let his hair down, kicked his feet back and said what he actually thought for a, for a few months. The New Frontiers Foundation, under Dominic Cummings' directorship, released a publication called How Demographic Decline and Its Financial Consequences Will Sink the European Dream. It read, the consequences of economic stagnation, coinciding with rising Muslim immigration, cannot fill anyone familiar with European history with anything other than a sense of apprehension, at least, about the future of the continent. In the summer of 2002, um, we went, I think, to Santini's, a very expensive Italian restaurant, and he said, there's the we are seeing the biggest tribal movement of peoples ever from the east to the west. Uh, and it was the word tribal which hit me. It's an idea which has become since quite commonplace uh, with, uh, in neo-fascist thinkers, uh, populist thinkers. Was he worried about Western culture being eroded? I think that was there. This was something outside something, well, tribal, hostile even. I, I think there's been an incredible uh, poisoning of, of right-wing politics in this country. I think there is a, a really dangerous and unpleasant worldview about uh, Islam in particular uh, that is uh, incredibly worrying for our country. I don't think you can blame Dom alone for that uh, coarsening of politics, but he's certainly taken advantage of it. The New Frontiers Foundation failed to make an impact on mainstream conservative politics. It was yet another false start for Dominic Cummings. The much more spiky, uh, aggressive intellectualism of someone like Dominic Cummings didn't have a role to play, or so it seemed. Oye! Oye! Londoners say yes! Under Tony Blair, there were referendums on everything whether there should be a London mayor, whether the Northern Ireland peace process should carry on, and so on and so on. Scotland has a parliament, Wales has an assembly, and London has a mayor. Now three regions in the north of England could get their own assemblies. Millions of people are going to be asked whether they'd like a dedicated assembly working just for their area. Our proposals today will give the regions of England new choices, new powers, and a new voice. By liberating the potential of our regions, we will be helping Britain to prosper. In 2004, Dominic Cummings travelled up to his native Durham to join the North East Says No campaign against a regional assembly. Dominic would usually come up at the weekends and we'd meet up for a drink in the pub and sort of bounce ideas around. I've used the phrase um, strategy advisor to describe his role. He, he was more in the chateau than in the trench. It was very much um, uh, a testing ground for a possible um, EU referendum at some point in the, uh, down the line. So just talk me through this. Uh, th th Dominic Cummings is, is using one referendum basically as an intellectual, fertile hunting ground for another. 
Dominic believed in that issue. He didn't want a North East Assembly, but it was a way of testing out ideas and campaign techniques for that future referendum campaign. The only way of winning was as a people versus politicians campaign. And in every age and nation, there is a certain market for that. But we were getting towards the time where that was becoming especially pronounced. Remember 1997? We were told that things can only get better. But politicians have failed us. We were going to be running an anti-politician message. Um, there is no point in striking to wound. You either kill someone or you ignore them. I mean, the effect on the other side was, was rather like putting a hamster in a food blender. Uh, dead. Now, politicians want even more power for themselves by creating a regional assembly made up of more full-time professional politicians. They were discovering new ways of whipping up public opinion, you know, anti-establishment, anti-elite, um, anti-politicians, anti-those in power. The establishment simply couldn't see this mood of anti-politics coming. Did it feel an anti-Westminster campaign? There was certainly a big sentiment at the time that was anti-Westminster. We had a load of £50 notes printed saying, politicians talk, we pay. We went down to Dominic's uncle's farm uh, and uh, in one of the tractor buckets we ended up burning hundreds and hundreds of these £50 notes just to show the more politicians you have, the more they cost. Would you say this was the first really populist campaign in modern Britain? Yes, these messages might be called by some people populist. I would call them um, arguments and feelings that represented what people in the North East and elsewhere outside London were thinking. <laughs> It was very clear very early on that we'd won a thumping majority. We'd actually vindicated a particular approach to running a campaign. Cummings wrote, We won the 2004 referendum with every force in the North East hostile. It was a training exercise that turned out surprisingly well. The referendum in the North East was the first howl of fury, which was saying that London was becoming too much like a country unto itself. It was, so to speak, an unaddressed issue that was bound to come back and haunt someone further down the line. Cummings now had his first referendum victory behind him and had seen firsthand how a disillusionment with politicians could be harnessed to mobilise support for a campaign. I now declare David Cameron to be the duly elected leader of the Conservative Party. With David Cameron came in, he clearly was a very different sort of Conservative. I said when I launched my campaign that we needed to change in order to win. Now that I've won, we will change. He thought, unless we make dramatic change, we are seriously never going to get back to power. In 2007, Michael Gove was appointed as the Shadow Secretary of State for Education. Uh, and he'd asked Dominic Cummings to be his chief of staff. This sort of guy turned up like he'd been dragged through a hedge backwards. Um, and so sort of the first thing he said to me was, I don't know anything about education, could you start from scratch? They have a kind of uh, Butch and Sundance style kind of relationship where they egg each other on. Let's get the fight started. Someone count one, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. They almost didn't need to speak to each other. They, they were so much um, on the same wavelength. For both Cummings and Michael Gove, their first taste of government was tantalisingly close. Her Majesty the Queen has asked me to form a new government and I have accepted. I aim to form a proper and full coalition between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. After the election in 2010, Dominic went with Michael Gove to number 10 and sort of stood outside whilst Michael went in to be appointed by David Cameron. Everyone thought that he, they'd just be going together to the department. And in the conversation, uh, David Cameron said to Michael, one condition for, for you having this role is that you can't have Dominic. Andy Coulson has sort of given me this advice that he's just too dangerous, he's too off message, and he'll cause us too many problems. 
Andy Coulson didn't want him in there because he could see that Cummings was someone who had very little respect for the centre of power and he probably, uh, in terms of David Cameron's uh, well-being, made a correct judgment call. He still turned up quite a lot. He was, however, enormously frustrated during that period. It was the most unhappy I ever saw him because he didn't have any formal power or control. Cummings' hopes had been dashed and he was out in the wilderness again. The Prime Minister's Director of Communications, Andy Coulson, has resigned. He's been under intense pressure over allegations of phone hacking by the News of the World when he was the paper's editor. Andy Coulson's departure was a sliding doors moment for Cummings. David Cameron now gave the go-ahead for Cummings to join Michael Gove at the Department for Education. Well, I remember visiting Michael Gove's office. He had, and very proudly displayed, a rather beautiful black and white print of Malcolm X. Its symbolism was clear, which was by any means necessary. I think they both had a belief that, that history changes by conflict and that, that incremental change never really works. And I think they encouraged that strain of thought in, in each other. Cummings led the charge in taking on what he and Michael Gove called the blob. It was a very good general way to denigrate any opposition, however well informed and however well evidenced. Like the blob, it descends and it suffocates and it crushes people. So you're suffocating hope. Dominic Cummings found confirmation of his beliefs about the slow, dreary, entropic nature of bureaucracy. He spotted it everywhere. He spotted it in every cupboard. He spotted it around every corner and every corridor. You have this huge system in, in, in Whitehall. Uh, in, in my opinion, it's largely dysfunctional. The whole wiring of it means that you're going to keep seeing the same kind of problem over and over again. Cummings would later write about the need to shake up bureaucracies. Seldom does a political institution demonstrate high performance. Such incidents, sometimes terrifying, are generally ascribed to the happenstance of a particular individual often described as an evil genius. Mr. President, I would not rule out the chance to preserve a nucleus of human specimens. Once they vanish, institutions tend to revert to type and little is learned. He wrote on his blog that sometimes you need an evil genius to come in. Was that how he saw himself, Dominic Cummings? Yes, I think he definitely did. I was at one meeting with Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings, halfway through, stormed into the room wearing no shoes and draped himself over a chair and just sat there uh, whistling to himself and looking at me with con complete contempt. It was an attempt to intimidate me. Allegations of bullying were made against Dominic Cummings and another colleague by a civil servant in the department. You have direct responsibility for the management of your spads. It was, I understand the case, that the allegations of bullying um, were found to be unfounded. Would you call him a bully? I would, yes. Shouting, losing his temper. I, th I would say that that behaviour is reprehensible in the highest degree. He wants a strong... Um, you know, clear good and evil story. So in education, the unions were evil, the local authorities are evil. The problem for them is that you end up losing natural allies. It led to clashes with the civil service, it led to clashes with the teaching profession, and it led to clashes with the Tories' coalition partners, the Lib Dems. On the day the 2012 Olympics started, he decided to stick out that teachers would no longer need to be qualified to work in state schools and academies, which within the sector is an extremely provocative thing to do. The Department for Education says the move will allow more schools to bring in brilliant people who are experts in their field. The National Union of Teachers has described the decision as perverse. Did it set up barriers if people thought that it was a leaky ship. It certainly reduced trust and made the whole relationship much more difficult. So early on, Michael Gove and Nick Clegg got on very well. But as these announcements kept happening, the trust just disappeared and it got to the point where 
there, Nick Clegg um, actually sent an advisor to sit in the office to sort of monitor him all the time. Look, uh, there, you, you have this from time to time in politics. You have people who aren't sort of elected to anything, who don't have any authority of their own, and when they get a sort of backroom advisor's job, it all slightly goes to their head. It was getting too troublesome and problematic, and there were too many... The critics were piling up. Well, I remember him telling me about four months before he left that he was planning to leave. He does have an attention deficit issue, and, frankly, he tends to move on to the next thing. Cummings had gained an insight into the inner workings of the political machine, but had failed to build alliances. As he had done with Ian Duncan Smith before him, Cummings left prematurely. On his own again, he created a blog to voice his radical ideas for the future of government. I'm, I'm, I'm happily uh, unemployed, uh, very happy unemployed at the moment. I think we need to do things differently. The current systems just don't work um, and, and we need new ones. We copy you down, Eagle. He is a radical anti-establishment thinker. Cummings' time in government convinced him that the political system was fundamentally broken. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. And that nothing short of radical overhaul could transform it into what he called a high-performance institution. For solutions, he looked not to politicians, but to mavericks and rule-breakers who've taken bold risks to achieve their grand visions. The engineers who paved the way for the moon landings. George Muller turned the failing NASA bureaucracy into an organisation that could put man on the moon. Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now. The computer scientists who developed the internet. How do we get rid of all the wires and build something different? And the creators of the first nuclear weapons. If lawmakers knew how the Manhattan Project and Apollo were done, the lack of legal process, things happening with a mere handshake, they would be stunned. A lot of these models are very militaristic top-down, quite macho ideas of government. Consistently throughout his blogs and throughout his approach is a decision to say this system is broken and the best way to deal with it is to creatively destroy it and rebuild from scratch. Cummings now presented his own vision for a new body aimed at advances in science and technology based on the US organisation DARPA. DARPA was set up as part of the US panic about Sputnik. We should create a civilian version of DARPA aimed at high-risk, high-impact breakthroughs. For it to work, it would have to operate outside all existing EU procurement rules. Otherwise, it would be as dysfunctional as the rest of the system. He thinks doing exciting things with clever people is applicable across the whole range of human activity and that a lot of the way government operates makes that difficult rather than easier. And that's the primary reason why he actually wanted to leave the EU. He quoted the communist revolutionary Vladimir Lenin. Sometimes nothing happens in decades and sometimes decades happen in weeks. Big changes are possible if people are prepared. Three years ago, I committed to the British people that I would renegotiate our position in the European Union and hold an in-out referendum. Now I'm delivering on that commitment. You will decide, and whatever your decision, I will do my best to deliver it. By 2016, Cameron was feeling pretty unbeatable. He had the sense that it would be all right. Matt Elliott came to me and said, we need a campaigner, and I said, do it. Dominic is the best in the business. We don't want him too much front of house. He doesn't always disguise his view of politicians, but we definitely want him running the strategy. Dom is very, very good at, you know, really digging down into the research. You know, a lot of polling, 
doing a lot of focus groups, really getting his mind into what the public are thinking. In Brexit, the uncivil war, Cummings is depicted developing the slogan that changed everything. Take control. I like it simple, clear. Empowering. Brilliant. Mm. Mm. It's presented as a moment of genius. The truth is more prosaic. When I did the Euro campaign 15 years before, we, we, we developed the slogan then of keep the pound, keep control. And we never could beat that. Take back control. 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 Their ideas, their memes, their arguments had been road tested and finally and perfectly calibrated and tuned by the time we get to the referendum. The Remain side would make it up as they went along. You're a pretty central figure to the Stronger In campaign. Did you feel at that point you were running completely different, asymmetric campaigns? I think we realised very, very early on that we were in trouble. There was going to be a guerrilla war campaign against us where people just ran out of the jungle, threw a bomb and then ran away. Every week we send £350 million to Brussels. Money that's wasted. That's enough to build a new hospital every week. The reason why we sometimes said send was because we wanted to try and provoke the rage of the in campaign into getting into a fight about the whole thing. And happily for us, um, that's what they did. Again, the use of contested figures on the famous vote leave bus had its seed in the anti euro campaign 15 years earlier. The whole point was they brought to public attention that membership of the EU was expensive. And the fact that people were arguing back and forth about exactly how expensive it was, well, that was part of the magic of it. That was part of the genius of the discussion. But the campaign was about to step up a gear. Dominic Cummings' great skill is to understand the psychology of normal people, basically probing their fears and making sure that the things that they're concerned and worried about are put front and center. Imagine what will happen to public services when Albania, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and Turkey join the EU. It was not true that Turkey is going to imminently join the EU and as a result 80 million people could flood into this country. And yet systematically and consistently that was presented as a truth and that was a real problem. Did you ever feel that in the interest of victory he was perhaps trying to appeal to people's nastier, darker instincts? No. I don't think that's a fair characterization. He's, he's very much a, a global Britain guy. So how did that fit in with, with Turkey joining the EU then? I don't really remember Turkey being that much of an issue. You don't remember Dominic Cummings telling people to get the message out by saying, Turkey, 350 million, Turkey, 350 million. Those are your twin messages. No, I think our, our absolute message was take back control. Dominic Cummings' allies say that actually the Turkey claims played a very little insignificant part in that whole campaign. Oh, it was huge, and I don't think there's any debate about it, that if you look on the record, Dominic Cummings and others have made clear that they knew that Turkey was incendiary. It was front and centre in terms of all of their advertising, in terms of their social media. We basically dumped the entire budget uh, in the last 10 days, and really in the last three or four days. Roughly about seven million people saw something like one and a half billion digital ads. Vote Leave defied the opinion polls to achieve a historic victory. 82,000. Yeah! What are we doing? But for Cummings, it was the synthesis of years of training in how to defeat the political establishment. You guys did this, and you'll always remember it. At that moment when we were triumphant, when we had, against all the odds, won this extraordinary victory, there was this deep-seated exhaustion, the culmination of a 15, maybe even 20-year campaign. Vote Leave was fined for campaign overspending. And Cummings was later held in contempt of Parliament for refusing to appear at a select committee on fake news.
There is a, a supreme irony here that the, the mastermind of the Leave campaign, whose sole raison d'etre was all about parliamentary sovereignty, yeah. about taking back control, is actually turning his back on this place uh, in a show of arrogance and contempt yeah. that cannot go unmarked and unpunished. Here, here. Cummings had long seen Brexit as the starting point in a radical reshaping of Britain. And as David Cameron left Downing Street, the prospect of a vote leave government seemed a real possibility. Dominic Cummings was exhausted, wanted to go on holiday. Match made Michael Gove and Boris Johnson together, said, Boris, you're the leader. Michael, you're supporting him. Go and win the leadership campaign, but I want no part of it. I'm going on holiday. And off he went. He fully expected to come back and be a leading light in negotiating a Brexit deal, and it didn't happen. It would be Theresa May, and not Boris Johnson, who took the reins. Cummings was now powerless to direct Britain's future. There was a period where he had to convince other people that it was all being done badly. And then there was a period of kind of irascible despair and comedy that it was being done quite so badly. And then I think he knuckled down to business and started thinking about, well, this isn't going to work, it's not going to last, so what comes next? Biding his time, Cummings took unlikely inspiration from Jean Monnet, the founder of the European Union. Monet showed that if ideas are developed in advance, then sometimes they're grabbed by powerful people searching for a path in short-term crises. I will shortly leave the job that it has been the honour of my life to hold. I do so with no ill will, but with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. Tonight at 10, Boris Johnson launches his campaign to become the next Prime Minister. We must come out on the 31st of October. I'm not thinking about promises for the next 15 days, I'm thinking about the next 15 years. During the leadership campaign last summer, you found yourself having dim sum lunch with Dom Cummings. And what happened? This intense looking figure turned up. He said, you've got to say that you're going to do three things. You're going to beat Jeremy Corbyn, reunite the country, get Brexit done. Those are your three things. Right? And I thought, that's really good, I'm brilliant. So then the next day, I then see Sajid Javid tweeting out, there are three things we need to do. And then the day after, Boris, there are three things we need to do. And Jeremy Hunt, there are three things we need to do. He wanted influence, he wanted to change the country, and he didn't mind too much which vessel it was or who won. When it became clear that Boris Johnson was likely to be the Prime Minister, um, there was a big wooing operation, get the old gang back together. But Cummings was only prepared to work for Boris on his terms. He wanted to be in charge of all the special advisers and he was not prepared to have someone over his head in Downing Street. And his argument to Johnson was, the only way you get Brexit on the terms that you want is if you do it my way and Boris Johnson had seen Dominic Cummings in action and he wanted that at the heart of his government. We're going to fulfil the repeated promises of Parliament to the people and come out of the EU on October the 31st. No ifs or buts. As Boris Johnson entered Downing Street, Dominic Cummings was ready and waiting to take up his new position as the Prime Minister's most senior advisor. So he enters number 10 on the day that Boris Johnson becomes Prime Minister. Did that surprise you? It didn't surprise me that Boris turned to him. He can do the market research. He can do the, the comms, like Alistair Campbell could. He can organise things based on his time at the Department of Education. So really, his skill set spans all the different areas you need to run an effective machine. Cummings now had his hands on the levers of power. It was clear from the very start 
that Dominic was in control. I am not a morning person, so to be summoned to a 7.55 a.m. meeting, even at 10 Downing Street, was not something I was massively thrilled about. Dominic stood at the front and he told us, if you leak, you will be marched from your desk by the head of security at your department, your pass will be taken off you and you will be sacked. You have no rights. On the 29th of August, Cummings' threats were realised. Sajid Javid's aide, Sonia Khan, was called to number 10 after Cummings suspected her of leaking government plans to Philip Hammond. Sonia Khan was brought in without notice to see Dominic Cummings and within a matter of minutes was dismissed with an accusation of, of leaking. There was no process there. She had no ability to defend herself. She was escorted from the building under armed police escort. She was humiliated, essentially, in front of civil servants. And then what followed was a doubling down of that by anonymous briefings from Number 10. So this is clearly bullying behaviour from Dominic Cummings and I think sent shockwaves across the civil service. Word spread like wildfire across the WhatsApp groups and it was very clear from what happened with Sonia Khan that Dominic meant business. You do what you're told and if you don't do what you're told then there would be severe consequences. People around the Prime Minister should not need fear to control individuals. Coming soon had bigger targets in his sights. The headlines, Tory MPs who are threatening to block a no-deal Brexit have been warned they face being thrown out of the Conservative Parliamentary Party and barred from standing at the next election. Dominic Cummings frequently mentioned Dominic Grave, Greg Clark, David Gawke, people in his mind who were frustrating the will of the people. I just caught Dominic Cummings in Parliament and he said, we've got to clean the bums out, we've got to clean the people out. And I thought, ah, oh, yeah, it makes a kind of sense. And then as he walked away, I thought, wait a second, I'm one of those, I'm one of those bums that's being cleaned out. Greg Clark got a phone call from Dominic Cummings and was told in no uncertain terms, you effing people need to learn that this is what we're doing. There was a sort of tone there which was more like a, a US gangster movie. Don't you get it? We're just trying to purge you. Quite a few people said, well, if that's going to be the way you want to play it, I'm not going to be intimidated. The eyes to the right, 328. The nose to the left, 301. Yeah. Not a good start, Boris. Two former Conservative chancellors are among 21 rebels who have been suspended from the party tonight after helping to defeat Boris Johnson in a key Brexit vote. We were out within an hour of the vote. This suited the Cummings Maoist confrontation narrative. This was politics in the raw. It seemed to represent a new style of politics from number 10. Nothing, including the stoking of huge divisions within the party, was going to stop the government from enacting what they saw as the will of the people. Do you think there was any worry from Boris Johnson's side about seeing the whip removed? He must have been convinced that he needed to throw his whole weight behind Dominic Cummings, and it must have felt like a white knuckle ride at times. For Cummings, it was a return to the people versus politicians strategy that he'd hammered home in the Northeast with Boris Johnson presented as the voice of the people. And this narrative was about to get heavy duty. There's no doubt in my mind that on Brexit specifically, Dominic saw Parliament as an impediment to the will of the people. I was a Remainer, my side lost. I got over that in a couple of hours. The Dominic Greaves of this world clearly did not. Rumours spread through Westminster that the government planned to close down Parliament for several weeks, a move known as prorogation. I got leaks from within government of people who started becoming really alarmed about what was being proposed, and it was clear from them that this was coming from Dominic Cummings. This was, for me, the declaration of war. <laughs> On the 10th of September, politics entered turmoil as Parliament was officially prorogued. 
This is not, however, a normal prorogation. It is not typical. It is not standard, and it represents an act of executive fiat. Proroguing Parliament was about closing down the people we elect to debate and scrutinise, so the government would have had no opposition. Clearly, Boris Johnson was convinced by the argument that Dominic Cummings made. Parliament standing in the way of the will of the people. I think it's a very dangerous rhetoric. It is clearly populist in its nature. It was the point where we thought, this is a government that will stop at almost nothing to achieve a particular objective. And there was definitely a lot of worry, a lot of jitteriness among special advisers in terms of what was going to happen. Dominic stood at the front of the uh, Friday meeting and said, you've got to be, as he put it, cool like Fonzies about this. Morning. Morning, Tina. Morning, Tina. Morning, Tina. The government was hauled up in front of the highest court in the land to determine if its actions had been legal. The effect on the fundamentals of our democracy was extreme. No justification for taking action with such an extreme effect has been put before the court. The court is bound to conclude, therefore, that the decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament was unlawful. I think the prorogation was an unusual and unwanted misstep. But Boris and Dominic then did something very smart and very quick, which is they used the crisis to their advantage and repositioned the party as the only voice for all of the leavers. I did then get the distinct impression that the number 10 press machine started to go on the warpath. There was a briefing to the Mail on Sunday saying that Oliver Letwin, myself and Hilary Benn were in the pay of foreign governments. If Dominic Cummings wasn't responsible for it, then all I can say is that the number 10 press office has run completely out of control. This was politics being conducted by Number 10 Downing Street in a manner that I don't think I've ever seen in my lifetime, and I hope I never see again. It was when Number 10 moved from uh, the gentle art of, of, uh, of spin into actually turning itself into a, a lie machine for propaganda purposes. What I see is a populist prime minister aided by an equally populist advisor um, hell-bent on achieving what they want to achieve uh, 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 by any means necessary. And this is, this is populism in its purest form. There is a widespread view that this parliament has run its course. And that, is, and that is because I simply do not believe that this House is capable of delivering on the priorities of the people, whether that means Brexit or anything else. There was a huge standoff. The majority of the parliamentary party thought an election would be a bad idea, but Dominic was pushing very hard to hold it, and it worked. MPs have given their backing to a December general election designed to break the deadlock over Brexit. Voters will go to the polls for the third time in five years. Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings had got the election they wanted. The people versus politicians narrative would now be tested at the polls with a coming slogan at the centre of the campaign. Having in 2016 argued that Brexit would be a massive boost to Britain, he completely dumped that message for the 2019 election and said, essentially, isn't Brexit a pain? Let's just get it done. Get Brexit done. Get Brexit done. Get Brexit done. And when the Conservative manifesto was launched, it seemed to bear many of the hallmarks of Dominic Cummings. In this manifesto, there is a vision for the future. And where in 10 years' time, scientists are starting to reap the huge rewards from our plans to double spending on research, from AI to new spaceports in Cornwall and Scotland that will send British-made satellites into the heavens and drive one of our most exciting industries. The manifesto promised a new agency, long dreamt of by Cummings, for high-risk, high-payoff research 
at arm's length from government. And echoing Cummings' war on the civil service, the manifesto stated, we need to get away from the idea that Whitehall knows best. Cummings now sought to bring on board the traditional Labour supporters who'd voted for Brexit. Days after the 2016 referendum, I emailed all of you to say thanks for your heroic efforts. I also said, keep an eye on my blog. If Brexit is in danger, then I will send up a bat signal here. Here we go. What Cummings has recognised is that people are beginning to think differently. The traditional party allegiances are now weaker predictors of how people are going to vote. Boris Johnson leads the Conservatives to a resounding election victory. They win their largest majority since the Thatcher years, gaining scores of seats from Labour. Outside number 10, Cummings' people versus politicians narrative was echoed by the Prime Minister. But here, in this people's government, the work is now being stepped up to deliver a parliament that works for the people. I remember the meeting immediately afterwards, I actually stood up at the back of the room and I said, Dominic, six months ago, you said we would get Brexit done, we would have an election and we'd win a majority. I thought that was actually pretty counterintuitive. I was 100% wrong, you were 100% right. Thank you very much and Merry Christmas. Winning the election has not stopped Cummings from taking to his blog. He provoked controversy by posting an eccentric job advert calling for data scientists, policy experts and assorted weirdos to join him in government. What he actually wants to do is set up the Avengers. It's a curious, slightly juvenile, initially endearing but ultimately exasperating longing to get out of the structures of government that actually make a country run and have this kind of super-powered group that will make everything brilliant immediately. Throughout his 20-year career, Cummings has walked right into the centre of conflict and his sometimes brutal approach to politics has tested even his closest allies. But in spite of all this, he has the ear of the Prime Minister. Is the... Um... Is the British approach to the coronavirus right? I can't talk to you today, guys. Cummings' dream of reshaping the country is now hostage to unfolding events as the country faces one of its greatest peacetime challenges. I must level with you, level with the, the British public. Um, more families, uh, many more families, are going to lose loved ones before their time. Now Cummings' ability to capture the public mood read human nature will be tested like never before in a world he can no longer control. He should perhaps return to the words of Otto von Bismarck, founder of the German Empire, whom he quotes on his own blog. Politics is a job that can be compared with navigation in uncharted waters. One has no idea how the weather or the currents will be or what storms one is in for. In politics, there's the added fact that one is largely dependent on the decisions of others. And if the friends on whose support one is relying change their minds, the whole plan miscarries. <laughs> <laughs>